Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com just for discovering Trek listeners. Fansets, our pins have character. From deep down in the bowels of the USS Cerritos, welcome listeners, cadets, junior officers, and all-around non-coms to the podcast that barely goes where any podcast has gone before. What kind of holodeck adventures did Boimler, Mariner, Tendi, and Rutherford find themselves into this week in the latest episode entitled Crisis Point? Well, let's find out. My name is Dan Davidson, and this is Discovering Trek, Lower Decks. Thanks so much for joining us, and welcome to Discovering Trek, the Star Trek Universe companion, presented by Fansets. Each week we're here to break down the latest Lower Decks episode and have a whole lot of fun doing it. As always, we like to consider ourselves the finest waste extraction team on the USS Cerritos, because when we aren't cleaning it up, we are dishing it out. And when I say we, I, you know I can't do this alone. Oh no. For eight weeks now, these three wonderful people have joined me for just amazing discussions. So we're going to keep it going. And here they are now. First up, she is one of the hosts on Rewind, the Star Trek podcast, right here on the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. You know, if there was one person who would reprogram the holodeck to make this a better and more cohesive podcast, it would be her. She is the highly entertaining and very sophisticated Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> like That's the last thing that. I would do with my holodeck time. Come on. <laughs> well, I thought okay. you were laughing at him describing you as sophisticated. Oh, yeah, that too. Give me a break. <laughs> hey, you, you be quiet. You're not up for a couple more people. Next up, uh, if you were to select a specific Star Trek alien species for each host of Discovering Trek, chances are this guy would be our pack lid. Uh, is it because of his low IQ, or is it because he makes things go? Either way, we are really glad he's here. His name is Cassie. Sh- K- Cassie? Casey Shasky? <laughs> Casey, how you doing, buddy? Nailed it. Wow. <laughs> Melissa Bartholomew, dick. It's great to be here and continue our 47-year friendship. 47, yes. Okay, well, that's mm. good to hear. I'm, I'm looking forward to it continuing on for 47 more. Um, yeah, exactly. And rounding out this... Uh, amazing and fun panel is the man who just completed another flight around the sun and boy are his wings tired Boom! smash Boo. sorry Boo. Uh, he, happy birthday buddy he's my good friend my brother in trek and my amazing number one he is bill smith hey man hey stan hi cassie <laughs> hi sue it's nice to see you all <laughs> great to be here for the penultimate episode of lower decks season one Oh, penultimate episode. What does that mean? What's penultimate? Next to last. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that everyone had clarification. Cassie looked very confused. Um, yeah, we so, were confused. <laughs> so, so yeah, next to last episode, Crisis Point. Uh, we're going to start right away with getting ranks. I am really interested in hearing what everybody's rank is for this week. Um, let's start with Casey this week. Uh, what is your rank, sir? One to four pips. Uh, without giving anything away, Why? Name, rank. Chekhov. Pavel. Rank. Admiral. Okay, uh, I give this three pips. Um, I was very entertained by this episode, but also quite disturbed by this episode. That happens a lot on this podcast. Disturbed is... um is running rampant on Discovering Trek. Sarah, what did you give for uh, for a rating this week for a rank? I gave it a two. A two? Okay. I gave it a two. A two. I will, so we got a th- it, yeah, I, well, not my favorite. Okay, so we have a three and a two. And Bill, what's uh, that you? I'm giving this one a half a pip. That's pretty Ooh. low. Half a pip, mainly for the, the TMP homage uh, for the flyby of the Cerritos. That was the uh, best part of it? That was the best part of it. Okay. Other, other than that, uh, largely I thought the episode was uh, far too dark. Okay. Uh, I, I've loved every other episode uh, of the season. Even though I may have rated some of them low, I hated this episode. 
Okay. Hey, hey, that's why we're here. We're here to talk about it. For myself, uh, I had a lot of problems with this episode, and we're going to get into it, I'm sure, in Deck 47. Um, this was my least favorite episode of the season. There was a lot of things that I appreciated. There are a lot of things that I had huge problems with, so I ended up giving this one a one, which is tied for my lowest, I think, for the season, but it is definitely my least favorite episode of the season. So we got a one, a two, a three, and a half. So all over the spectrum. That's amazing. So it'll be interesting uh, to see what the reasons are for those ratings later on in Deck 47, but that's way down the road here on the, on the, uh, on the show this week. So Bill, uh, before you dazzle us with your six-sentence recap got it right this week uh where can listeners go to share their deepest darkest desires as well as their thoughts on crisis point priority one message from starfleet coming in on secured channel well dan on both facebook and twitter you can find us at discovering trek and either of those places you can leave us comments questions or even tell us what your holodeck movie might be like and of course if you'd like to leave us a voicemail you can do so by going to our website at trekgeeks.com and clicking on the giant blue button on the right hand side Please do remember, though, that any comments you leave us could be used in a future episode of Discovering Trek. Dan. Thank you, Bill. Black alert. Black alert. From here on in, folks, this episode of Discovering Trek contains spoilers. So if you haven't watched episode nine of Star Trek Lower Decks, stop listening right now. Head on over to CBS All Access and check it out. Otherwise, you run the risk of finding out plot developments and character details for Crisis Point. It's time for the best recap in the galaxy. It's the Six Sentence Recap, starring the one and only Bill Smith. Six sentences, Bill, starting now. Go. And action. Okay, so as we're learning with each episode of Lower Decks, it's kind of hard to get these jammed into six sentences, but we're going to do the best we can. And here we go. Mariner has some mommy issues, and Mom, otherwise known as Captain Freeman, has ordered her to therapy, which Mariner has no use for. Boimler has created the perfect simulation of the crew on the holodeck. Mariner takes some artistic license with Bradward's program and turns it into a holodeck movie starring herself as the villain. She assumes the identity of Vindicta and seeks revenge on Freeman for all of her mom oppression. Yes, that's a portmanteau of mom and oppression, just in case. That's Uh. that's not one of my sentences. Mariner vaporizes crew member after crew member until she's forced to fight a holodeck recreation of herself and she loses, learning that therapy can be very helpful. And Boimler learns Mariner's secret. Now, this just in from Podfleet Command. I am told that we have a bonus seventh sentence, which is undocumented and coming in over a secure frequency. Apparently there was a B plot and nobody really cares about it. Back to you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have anything to say with that. That was a great sound. I'm just going to turn it over to Sarah for her to start her part because that was pretty good, man. I got to go yeah. laugh that one up. <laughs> I like it. Work, Bill, it's always good. Let's just be honest. I mean, nobody else can do the sentence recaps like you can. So thank you. Um, this next guy, you may have seen him on that failed reality show in the early 2000s called Farmer Wants a Wife. Um, <laughs> he's here Getting now to, to talk track with us and to, uh, you know, seek out some really good Easter eggs in the episode. He saves my butt every day with the fact that I don't recognize crap in these episodes. And I always look forward to it. So here we go with Casey's Cornea Corner. Look at that. Well, let's see. Let's dive into it. Um, in in this deep and kind of disturbing episode, we got a what, very, very, very much a movie extravaganza of things popping up left and right. One, you know, we had the return of the Argo type buggy. Um, we get Da Vinci in the holodeck shooting skeet. So much more exciting than he'd ever been in Voyager. Uh, we get kind of Wrath of Khan-ish soundtrack for the movie credits that starts Definitely. at the very beginning, which was fantastic. And those opening credits, to me, seem to be a mashup of kind of the TOS-era movie season five of TNG and Richard Donner's 1978 Superman. 
Uh, Zahn gets a shout out, but it's not not a great shout out at all. No. Um, we get a very nice hidden ganja reference in engineering. Uh, Kaba Lake, kind of like a TNG insurrection meets Waterworld meets Point Break type of a scene. Uh, Shax is ready to F you up and send you to hell to hang out with the Pareths with that movie-sized budget. Man, that was an Arnold Commando Predator type gun going on there. Um, we get in the turbo lift. You see it when they're going up to the bridge. We get a different interior of the tuber. Tur- Thanks, Dan. You, you messed, you've messed Cassie up. Tuber. <laughs> the turbo lift lighting and interior is different. When we get onto the bridge, it's so much just lens flare. Awesome. And we hear the Kelvin timeline bridge sound effects. You get more crew on the bridge than normal, which is a very movie type thing to do. Um, we've got Dr. Migli. Miglimo? <laughs> I'm going to go with that one. A bird like. You know, person, and I, I thought about this, I go, is this like a reference to Dr. Fraser Crane, played by Kelsey Grammer, who cameoed in the TNG episode Cause and Effect? Interesting. I maybe. Don't know, maybe. We could see. We get a Toby the Targ reference, which I'm wondering, did Mariner steal that from Molly O'Brien on DS9? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we get the Kelvin warp effect which was kind of cool and interesting. Vindicta quotes Shakespeare like many, many other Trek villains. She fights herself, which is kind of like Enemy Within, who gods destroy, or Undiscovered Country. Uh, she's in charge of a modified D7, and I always wanted to cling on to, say, okie dokie there, kind of like a Dr. Brown. <laughs> wow. Wow. Sarah, you can give a wow. That's okay. No, wow. Well, don't, don't even thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, um, it was very reminiscent of Wrath of Khan with the villain being on the view screen and just hanging out there for a while. Oh my gosh, we get a saucer section crash landing like generations, but it doesn't crash. It just rolls. Yeah, you know? I love that it just stayed on edge. <laughs> Well, you know, on the Cerritos, that's how they roll. Oh, my God. What are we doing? Uh, we are I'll be here all week. I'll be here all week. <laughs> See, I took it more of a, well, we won't. <laughs> of a mashup of, of Generations and Beyond, where the saucer section crashes. I, I took it as yeah. a mashup of that in Voyager and yeah. Timeless. Where, Timeless, uh, yep. You know, um, where the ship crash lands on the ice planet. Mm-hmm. There you go. Right on. We get Shempo. Hey, Sarah, no yawning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll quicken the pace. Shempo, a Three Stooges reference, which I'm sure would really work with the audience for Lower Decks. Um, Boimler falls twice. Once he falls into the lake, and the second time he falls, and it's very much like Trek Five in Yosemite. Not a hard word to say again. Yosemite. Yosemite. Yeah. Then we get a one-minute visual orgasm of the Cerritos. Which, on a 25-minute, 25-second episode, that's 4% of the episode. So, holy moly. Talk about stamina. I need it. Yikes. Now. And then, at the end, we get the signatures of our characters, a la Undiscovered Country, and credits. That's it, bitch. I'm out. Oh, uh, we can really hope. <laughs> Bye. I, I did love, the, uh, I did love wow. the appearance of Leonardo da Vinci. Yes. Um, I had him that made shoot me and skeet, right? Yeah. Who, who would know he's that good of a shot? I, I mean. Didn't. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me, Dan. You don't know much anyway. Well, I was going to say, I didn't even know if they had developed weapons of that kind during Da Vinci's time. So it could have just been, you know, that's why engineering feat hadn't happened yet. But that's just me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> why did we do this show with him? <laughs> I, I really don't know because he's the one who records it. I think that's why. Uh, that's, that um, could easily change. That's a lot of Easter eggs, pal. I'm just going to change the subject right now. Thanks, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Lots of. I I will say the one thing that I loved about this episode was, as we've talked about in different weeks, 
all the callbacks and the way that they're able to do them is really great. Uh, everybody on Twitter this week has been talking about the Cerritos flyby with the shuttle, with the music that was the, right. the lower decks theme, but it was so much TMP. It was it was really great how they did it. I thought it was more Wrath of Khan. It sounded very James I, I Horner. Excuse me, that's what yeah. I meant. My, my apologies. Uh, I meant I meant uh, Horner with, uh, with and Star it really Trek sounded yep. good arranged like yeah, that. I did. Yeah, it? yeah. Chris Westlake did an amazing job yeah. this week. With the it music and great. soundtrack of this episode, weaving everything together, I was like, "That was just seamless. It was gorgeous." Yeah, Loved it, it really was. Nicely done, man. I don't. I don't even think we have anything we can add to it. Do you guys? Because it's. Uh, that was it. Cool. I'm good. Well, then I gotta say, hey, everybody! One of our favorite parts of discovering Trek is talking about a particular group of friends that have an amazing company that just happens to be the exclusive sponsor of this here podcast. You know them. I know them. They're fan sets. They're awesome, and they're pulling out all the stops for an amazing Oktoberfest of pins. You got that right, Casey. You know, last month was pretty spectacular with Star Trek Day and the release of the first set of awesome new Lower Deck Crew pins, but October is going to be something special. They have lots of things in the works, and they have given us a little tease of what we can expect over the next month or so. Right, Dan? Right you are, Sarah. (laughs) Boy, this copy's horrible, isn't it? Who wrote this? <laughs> Who wrote crap? this? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's because I wrote it. Actually, though, <laughs> Sarah is 100% correct. Fansets has an amazing lineup of October releases coming your way, so let's get right down to business. You can purchase the Star Trek Discovery Lieutenant Boyce Micro Crew pin, as well as the Women of Trek Hoshi Sato pin, right now. Also available right now to pre-order over at fansets.com, finally, is the special Voyager Collector set commemorating the 25th anniversary of our favorite Delta Quadrant Stranded Crew. This set is gorgeous, people, and it consists of 10 beautiful crew member pins which come together to form the Voyager Delta, plus the Voyager 25 pin released earlier this year. It comes with a backer board and a black frame, and it will look kick-ass on your wall. But you need to pre-order your set right away because only 125 of these beauties will be available. Well, 123 because Bill and I have already pre-ordered ours. Uh, In addition to all this great news, you can now pre-order the Lower Decks Delta set. Yep, that's right. You pre-order the Lower Decks full-size badge pin, magnet-based badge, and mini badge all together. And finally, Lou, John, Joe, and the whole team are proud to announce the Fan Sets Delta program. As stated on their Fansets blog, quote, we are diving heavily into Star Trek Deltas and we'll be doing full-size Delta pins as well as full-size Delta magnets and mini pin versions of each Delta as well. So anyone that pre-orders is not only guaranteed their product from the first run, they also get it 30 days before anybody else gets it. Now, Bill, wake up, because I got to say that this new badge collection is going to revolutionize pin collectibles. Wow, that is a lot of Star Trek news from fans that stand so much so that you didn't even really get the chance to tell everyone that the Scooby-Doo collection has finally been released. And that must have been really hard for you because I know how much you've been looking forward to that. Uh, thank you, though, for not mm-hmm. stealing any more oxygen from the room uh, with your incessant babbling, uh, because well. <laughs> I really can't take listening to you anymore. Uh, seriously, though, that really is a lot of pins and great announcements from Fansets, as we always say. Fansets is currently working on adding new pins because they are fans just like you, and they know that you love to collect the coolest swag available. And we have a great offer just for Discovering Trek listeners. If you want to save 15% off your entire order at fansets.com, that's anything at Fansets, not just Star Trek stuff. Just enter the special discount code Lower Decks at checkout. That's Lower Decks in all capital letters with no spaces for some great savings. And don't forget that if you spend $30 or more, you're going to get free shipping in the U.S. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank our friends at Fansets for being the exclusive sponsor of Discovering Trek. You know, everyone, I remember a time of chaos, ensign logs, and wasted land. But most of all, I remember the road warrior, the woman we called Sarah. To understand who she was, we have to go back to the other time. So remember, dear Discovering Trek listeners, Sarah came here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and she's all out of bubblegum. Sarah? (laughs) That was awesome. Thank you. 
Okay, so I struggled with this episode. Um, I watched it, and then instantly was like, I, 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 I gotta just leave it. I didn't like it. I gotta come back and give it some attention. So when I watched it again, I decided that I was going to do my best to be positive, and I was going to pull from the main characters a good quote that kind of represented them, if I could find them in this episode. So with that said, here we go. Space, a final frontier. Because it was no longer Starfleet. So this is a huge victory for the good guys. You know, I'm really easy to get along with most of the time. But I don't like bullies and I don't like threats. And I don't like you. Let's make sure that history never forgets the name Enterprise. Hit it. With regards to Boimler, also known now as Shambo, <laughs> the great line, I love the captain and I don't want to be here. <laughs> and he's like, I, I would say that. And he would. That is that is Boimler in a nutshell. He, he loves the captain and he doesn't want to be in a lot of places that Mariner tends to put him. With regards to Rutherford, you are the best engineer in the fleet. I love how you program subroutines. It's breathtaking. It feels so good to say it. Um, I thought that was really sweet. And that was Rutherford in a nutshell. He's so in love with his job and he just wants everyone to know it. And it, yeah. it's kind of cute that he was scared to even share that information. And I just thought that was a great little like sub storyline. With regards to Tindy, it was a simple line that she said to Mariner angrily. This isn't you. And I liked mm. that because it was her yeah. standing up for herself. It was her being true to herself. And I thought it was just a good line. Just you go, girl, say it. And then Mariner, when she yelled at herself, they're not casting you as a villain. You are. And I thought that was a great line because it kind of just speaks a little bit to the madness in that episode about what we're really trying to get at in this whole episode of chaos. So then, of course, I just love in the background in so many episodes, whether it's visors or it's somebody yelling out something. And it was like, hell yeah, Chet, <laughs> when they found out that <laughs> Chet was doing something awesome. There's always that one guy in the background that has to yell something. And I love it every single time. So what about you guys? I know there was a lot of stuff in here for fans of the movies and stuff to pull from. So I'm interested to hear what you guys have. My favorite quote is really nothing to do with the movies. Um, it, it had to be Captain Freeman saying, warp me. <laughs> um, because that I was cool. I liked its warp time a few weeks ago, but uh, warp me just sounds um, it sounds right for the moment. I dug it. I was I was there. I um I really didn't have a favorite quote in this episode. There's nothing that really stood out to me. I did like the warp it. If I had to pick one, I guess it was kind of funny that uh, Mariner said it's the '80s, dude. We don't have psychological problems. I thought that was kind of an interesting <laughs> play on on yeah. time. Um, but other than that. I, I I really didn't have anything. What about you, Casey? Um, I, I, we can talk about it in a little bit. I mean, I found a lot of Mariner's quotes pretty deep about what she's dealing with and, and uh, going mm -hmm. through. Um, but I did find the Rutherford, if we bypass the Inda controls and suppress the sad events, which, you know, for the writers of Lower Decks, just know I'm an Indica gummy kind of guy. So it was a very, once again, we pull in the, uh, the, the ganja reference and just whip by on it really fast. And that, that was kind of one of the only quotes I enjoyed in the episode. This, this was a deep one. I was I was just going through some of the quotes um, that I've seen reference, and I did forget one. And I got to say, I do like this. Shax is probably one of my favorite characters in this series. I love him; he's great. I can't believe it took me a while to realize that he was Bajoran, but that neither here nor there. That's just me. Um, but I did love uh, when he was standing on the bar uh, and, and ten forward. He said, "When you get to hell, tell the pa race that Shax sent you a special delivery straight from Bajor." He's <laughs> awesome. I love Shax. Yeah. He's a Shaxx tough dude. Awesome. He tough is. Dude. Yep. I've loaded the appropriate decon gel into compartment B. So, it's time to take out that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Slather it all over ourselves and get into the decon chamber. I'm trying to get excited for this. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, oh you can't really. God. It's, um, with, you know, with the two of you, it's really not that easy to. Um, there's, there's three of us. I know I was talking mean me. about the two of you. I was not talking about Sarah. Thank you. Duh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <I still laughs> oh, God, the brainy. ego. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, so this week, <clears throat> wow, a lot of blood. 
lot yeah. of blood. Even if it was holographic blood, even though I did love when Tendi walked out of the holodeck, the yes. blood that was on her disappeared. That was yes. pretty cool. Nice touch. I did love that. So all that blood. But the thing that really jumped out at me here in the decon chamber this week, guys, and I think that you guys will all agree, Shax's earring after he exploded oh still had pieces of Shaq's ear attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> that was <laughs> it. It's not much more. Although we did see another Geordie visor. I yes, it, it was it was very quick. Um, it was uh, when they were That's on the said. at the very end at the at the very end when they were all on the cliff after the ship exploded and Boimler came down to get some more information. One of the crew members standing there, a female crew member had a Geordie visor on. Oh I missed it. Boom. <laughs> That's all I got. I Ooh, really great. Think- that's Great all it segment. Was. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a Mike Tyson moment there. Decon Shax Chamber's is going there. away for next season, I'm telling you right now. Less you talking? Okay. I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, I'm going to continue talking, Cassie. And uh, it's time for us to get in the turbo lift and go all the way down to the lowest of the lower decks to discuss some other elements of this week's episode in Deck 47. <laughs> Sponsored by our friends at Science Division. You know it, Stan. They're the makers of the Galaxy's first interactive Tribble that you can control with your very own smartphone. These brand new Tribbles will be an incredible addition to your Star Trek collection, and you can find out more at sciencediv.com. Science Division. Trouble's never been this fun. Okay, so um, we had a whole bunch of different rankings this week, from a half a pip to three pips, and I gave it a one. I gotta tell you, um, Mariner's fucked up. I'm just going to put that out there right now. She yeah. got some serious psychological problems, and that's one of the things that I had a problem with in this episode. I know that there are people that have psychological problems, and I'm not downplaying that at all. But this is Star Trek, and we're supposed to have that idea of what Starfleet officers are like. This woman should not be a Starfleet officer. If she's got this much deep, dark, violent tendencies in her head and how she wants to deal with the problems she's dealing with. She murders like 30 crewmen, vaporizes them. She's trying to kill her mom. She turns her best friend into an Orion sex slave girl. It, there were just so many things that she was doing that I'm like, oh my God, this is this is not right. And come, that's, I think, what I had a lot of problem with. Come on, they haven't been slaves for at least five years. <laughs> yeah, a whole five. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think you're right, and and this ultimately is why I gave it a half a pip. Does this episode have humor? Yes, it does. Does this episode yes. have some really great moments? Absolutely. Yep. But I think it's all undone by the fact that, well, uh, let me let me approach this from a different angle. Uh, Reg Barkley, when he had his hollow oh, addiction and was going into yep. the holodeck and recreating crew members um, in sort of diminutive fashion, it was considered not cool. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't cool. He was using them as a stand-in to learn how to deal with them, or at least to to shed some of his uh, his his energy or his 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 anger. And this is really that to the to the nth degree. No pun intended. Um, this is wrong. This is not therapy. This is not a therapeutic device. This is um, this is somebody who shouldn't be in Starfleet. If this is and- what's going on in her head. And to add to your point, Bill, I, I totally agree. Holopus, that's exactly what I was think of, thinking of during this. Reg had all kinds of issues, and he dealt with them in much lesser ways, and he was lambasted for it. Yep. And in, in all seriousness, to me, Mariner didn't understand that this was therapy, and I thought it was kind of a cheap way to end the episode on a positive note by her saying, oh, this is the best therapy. I never realized it. When, this, when she was killing all these people and trying to kill her mother with a jagged pipe, yeah. that was not therapy for her at the time. She no. didn't realize it, she said, until after the fact. So you're right. It had a lot of humor, great callbacks, and all kinds of things. But to me, it was just overshadowed by this dark Mm-hmm. obsession that she had with dealing with her problems in such a violent way. And that was something I really couldn't get over. Casey? Yeah, I, I hear you, man. Because when I was looking back at, at certain quotes that she says, you know, at the very beginning, Mariner's all, you should be free to do whatever you want. I think she's talking about herself. And then she goes in with her mom. She goes, you've been a jerk since I was eight. And then the... Yeah, thanks for ruining the awesome Captain Murder. This was all building to. Yeah. So, like, when I ranked it, I I, I go, I was entertained. I didn't enjoy it. I separated it for myself. It's kind of, it was like, for me, a Silence of the Lambs type thing, where I go, 
okay, I'm entertained by that film. I didn't particularly enjoy any of it, but it was well done. And this, it's just like we call it a frying pan to the face of, boy, this anger, this is not a humorous rebellion. And you guys saw, said you were finding humor here. I found very little humor in this episode, but I found it was a really deep dive into her character. And it's like, yeah, maybe she's completely in the the wrong business. She even says, if I wasn't on the Cerritos with my mom, I'd be out of here. Yeah. I'd be out of Starfleet. It's like, well, yeah, maybe this character should be out of Starfleet. Sarah, what do you think? Um, I agree with a lot of that. I think that had she even been doing what she was doing in a holodeck with made up creatures, it would have been an improvement. Um, it still would have been a little bit like, oof, that's a lot of, you know, killing in the name of training or anger management. But um, I think that that yet yeah, the fact that it was staff and her mother really overshadowed um, the episode because I did like a lot of what the other characters were doing. I really liked um, Tindy standing up for herself and that whole storyline for her. I thought it was a great, it was the first time yes. I really enjoyed her storyline, yes. to be honest. Yeah. Um, and same with Rutherford. I loved that. Um, and I, of course, the cat's always got some good cursing in the background. So <laughs> I, more of that is fine with me. <laughs> um, the thing I thought interesting though, somebody posted on Twitter today a poll and it asked the question, would it be worse if someone recreated you in the holodeck to kill you or to have sex with you? And I thought that was a really good question. And I'd be interested to know your guys' opinion because as a woman, I'd rather be murdered in the holodeck by somebody than the alternate because the other one's just too creepy and too... Mm, Whereas yeah. if someone was going to come at me and kill me, I'd like to think that I probably have a good heads up already that they're like not a fan of me and that I could probably find a way to protect myself. But the other is so creepy and it's like... I just thought it was a really good question because it was just so simple. And I was like, huh. well, they're both horrible, but I'm curious. Yeah. Um, because that's touching more on the Barkley almost, right? Yeah. That really inappropriateness. Is. I have to agree with you. I think yeah. that one feels definitely more like a violation than the other. Mm -hmm. um, the other one seems like just anger and anger, I, I mm -hmm. think can be worked through to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not with you and that particular person, but I mean, um, but, but you know, it's the, the other one is, is far more, I don't know. I, yeah. yeah. I think violation is the perfect word. Yeah. Yeah. It really is a violation. It's rapey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's super, it's super rapey. Let's, let's not yeah. sugarcoat this crap. It's yeah. rapey. It's like, yeah. ugh, no, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, no. I think we've got 100% agreement that I think we'd all be chosen to be killed instead. But I have two hypothetical questions that I want to ask you guys. The first one, I know that you're going to want to answer in a joking fashion because it's going to have to do with me. But I'm serious when I say this. If you saw me run this type of holodeck sequence and I was vaporizing crew members and going after to kill the captain, the second mother, would you ever trust me to go on an away mission again? Never. Never. How can Boimler Never. and Rutherford and Tendi no. ever have the same amount of trust after seeing what she was doing in this in this um, scenario? It was something yeah. that really made me like shake my head saying I would never go on an away mission with her again until I knew that she got the help she needed. It's the kind of thing well, I'd report, you know, much like they say now, if you see something, yeah. say something. Yeah. Um, I, I would absolutely say something either to the ship's counselor or to the first officer and say, look, this, yeah. this is not right. Yeah. This what is about, a problem. Uh, what about you, Sarah? I don't know if I would go to that extreme. I think that if uh, knowing after how many episodes we've seen of Mariner, and knowing that she's got a dark sense of humor already, I would think that this was just her and her awkwardness and inappropriateness taking it a little bit too far. I don't think she's dangerous. I don't think she's a threat, but I think it needs to be addressed. So if it was me and I saw it happening, I'd probably definitely say something to her and flag it. But I don't know if it automatically make me not trust her. Okay. Casey? I yeah I I'm kind of a little bit on the on the other end of the spectrum there because I go if I'm used to her darkness in a sarcastic way but I see this you know self referencing here I would go I don't know what she's gonna do and I don't know if she's gonna look out for me mm -hmm. if we're on a, an away mission so instantly my trust level goes down and then I don't trust myself as much because I had trusted her before. Right. And uh, I go, I don't mm. know my assessment of this person anymore. And it's just, it's a uh, quicksand. Mm. Where, where do you build? 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I like that reference. See, I live with that with Haley on a daily basis, so I guess maybe I'm more used to it. <laughs> uh, she's my I, mariner. <laughs> sister, I hear you. Look who I podcast with. Uh, there you go. Here's my other here's my other question that I had for you guys, and I'll start Sarah putting you on the spot. What would Captain Freeman be thinking if she saw what Mariner did in this holodeck? I've, would she feel guilt? Would she be even more pissed? Would she really want to get her help? Would she get rid of her off the ship? I mean, there's just a whole plethora of things that could have happened. I think this would be a really good example of a thing that if she saw it, she wouldn't have one of those crazy overreactions. She'd be sad. I think this would be a wake-up yeah. call for her. It's not just my daughter's acting out and it's the mom-daughter thing. That it, This would be a – it wouldn't be the reaction you'd expect. It would be a really quiet, internal – I needed to talk to her father and this is serious and this is not just I'm going to yell at her and punish her or or send her to therapy again. I think that this would be a way different yeah. reaction, a more serious one. Yeah. What about you, William? I, I think there'd be a little, what have I done? You know, yeah. how, how did I fail her? I think mm-hmm. that Freeman would be a little more introspective in addition to all of that to say, is this my fault? Could I have done something differently? Casey? Well, yeah, because you see at the end, I mean, Freeman kicks over the table, right? So mm-hmm. there's anger with the mother, there's anger mm-hmm. with the daughter. And I I just keep going back to what is this quote where she goes, you have been a jerk since I was eight. What happened when mm-hmm. Mariner was eight? Because mm-hmm. I don't know, is she in her late 20s, early 30s in, in this now? I don't know her age, is it, but something has been... Uh, percolating Brewing, since that yeah. time. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder if we'll ever see that in any type of flashbacks. Sarah, do you have anything else in regards to the episode specific? Um, I don't want to see the therapy bird again. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> it was funny yeah. for one episode, and now I'm like, nah, that's enough. <laughs> Can <laughs> I tell you, when I, when I first watched that, I thought that was John Billingsley. Mm. Because the voice uh, was spot on. Oh. Yeah. It turns out it's Paul F. Tompkins from yes. uh, the official Star Trek podcast. Yes. And, and any okay. one of a number of other things, but man, he could do a great John Billingsley impersonation and and get away with it. I think. <laughs> Optimism, <laughs> Captain. Sorry, <laughs> hey, Casey. Uh, I know that last week I accidentally stepped on you and didn't let you give your two cents. So I wanted to make sure that I gave you at least one cent today. Oh, thank you, my man. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I I really think that uh, th- this is an episode that people can go back to and. Really think, think about it, and see what's going on. And um, you know, like Sarah said, the the other storylines. Boimler was Boimler, his same old kiss ass self, and all this stuff. You know, Tendy stands up for herself. Great. Rutherford is a sweet, internally sweet person who is working it. And for our main character, I mean, you know, here's a lot of drama. In supposedly a, a humorous half-hour show, yeah. um, there's a lot of things that could go from here. I yeah, think I I'm agree. over the flip-flopping of Mariner. It seems yeah. like yes. it's one extreme to the next in an episode, and I'm having, having a hard time deciding if I like her or not now, because it's just so much every episode. Right? Like, Those are the flips that I've talked about before, where all of a yeah. sudden the character just flips, and it's like, th- yeah, story-wise, this, this is just is making the audience go you ha- I'm forcing you to come with us to show this aspect of the person and it doesn't seem very uh organic maybe she's been possessed this whole season and we're going to find <laughs> out next season it it does explain why she's still an ensign mm-hmm. um yeah. in many ways um yeah. I, I do want to say that that there are I have seen nothing but positive an effusive praise for this episode. Yeah. A lot mm-hmm. of people said it was their favorite of the season. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Our opinions clearly seem to be largely the minority, and I get it. That's okay. And yeah. In the realm of infinite diversity and infinite combinations, totally expect it. Mm-hmm. Um, I get why some people like this episode, but I, I felt it was just too dark. And I hate using this phrase because I tell other people not to use this phrase. Um, uh, the the actions of, of Beckett Mariner in this episode were not Star Trek. <gasps> That's the thing that I had a problem with. Yeah. And and yes, and it's so hard to separate the fact that this is a comedy yep. and it's an animated show, so you can get away with a lot more, but it is still Star Trek canon and it is still a Star Trek story. Well, it's, well, it's, it's, it's one more reason I'm not going to take it as canon. 
Okay. Yeah, There's but, that whole but even Zahn with that reference. being said, if with the with the whole with it being Star Trek, and, and we said this a couple of weeks ago, Starfleet would never have a freak farm on some planet. Yeah. Um. So yeah. it was very hard to, as much as there were great references in that episode, I had problems with that. But this one was on another level because it was just it was unexpected, and I'd love to to hear from the writers' room about what yes. they thought while they were doing this. Was Ugh. it something that they were really conscious about doing purposefully? Because let's face it. We all would like a holodeck sometimes to to fight battles or to live out things that we wanted that we have in our head, and this kind of took it to a level that I just didn't expect from a Star Trek show. That, I guess that's not why we want the holodeck. Come on, let's be that's honest. We all want to be a Riker. Want the <laughs> we all want to be a Riker. Um, and, and before people send hate mail, we do love this show. Absolutely. 100%. We are, we are big fans of Star Trek Lower Decks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This episode just didn't hit on many levels for, for many of us. Mm-hmm. Then that's where, like I was saying earlier, I was entertained. I didn't enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing I wanted to say is I said it a little bit at the beginning of this of this segment. There are people that have psychological issues that they're dealing with in real life. And for some people, this episode for them was great because it allowed them to see what some people may do to live out these things that they want to deal Mm -hmm. with their psychological issues. And I'm not downplaying that at all. I I, I just, for me, it was just a little bit more than I expected. I would love to see, you know, hour long dramatic Star Trek deal with that particular topic in Mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. Because I think it would be a very compelling, uh, very sobering look at, uh, at rage, at things like PTSD, Mm -hmm. at at a a number of things. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't think that it was appropriate for this. And if they were going to do it, I think it needed to be done very differently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome discussion, guys. I knew that this was going to bring out some good topics. And uh, as always, really, really well done. That was episode nine. That, man, Casey, what does that mean, dude? Long range scan of planet complete. It means we have one, one episode left. So guess what, everybody? Next time on Discovering Trek... <sighs> the season finale, no small parts. The USS Cerritos encounters a familiar enemy, and Tendi helps a struggling recruit find her footing. Until then, remember that you can subscribe to Discovering Trek by searching for us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere fine podcasts are found. Plus... Now you can support Discovering Trek and the Trek Geeks Podcast Network by subscribing to bonus content on Patreon. Get access to the unedited audio of all of our podcasts and a lot of other perks. We want to take a moment to recognize the following amazing producers of Discovering Trek. We are truly so grateful for their support. Ken Tripp, Charlie Mulvey, Chris Trebuzio, Craig Ewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Lionel Marchand, Matt McGonigal, Mike Bovia, Sean O'Halloran, Peter Craig, Ken Bird, Jamie Rogers, David Hood, Rachel Delaney, Kyle Castillo, Chaz Bradshaw, Kimberly Hartman, Christina Werther, Steph Lesque, Jim McMahon, and the lovely and talented Just Fashion. If you would like to support Discovering Trek and the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, zip on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks, where subscription levels start at $1 a month. We must be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we is. For more great Star Trek discussion, please, please check out the other podcasts from the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. In addition to Rewind with Sarah and Haley, there's also Politrex, there's Five Year Mission, the podcast, there's Deep Space Pride, and the brand new Infinite Trek, providing even more discussion on Star Trek Lower Decks every Tuesday. Plus, don't forget that Discovering Trek will break down every episode of Star Trek Discovery's third season starting in just two weeks on October 19th. To find all our podcasts and where you can download them, visit trekgeeks.com slash listen. The Trek Geeks Podcast Network. No one talks Trek like we do. That's a great tagline, man. Thanks. That's pretty cool. You know, this was dark. I'm not sure what was darker. Your face is dark. Thank you. No, that's not right. No. That's not right. I don't know what was darker, Mariner's Holodeck Program or this discussion on Discovering Trek. Or my beer. <laughs> C- Computer Arch. Ooh. Arch. Computer and Program. 
<laughs> you couldn't get Damn that it. lucky. That's real. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's going to wrap it up for our discussion on Episode 9 of Lower Decks. Thank you so much for listening. And be sure to his, hit us up with your comments on Facebook and Twitter to let us know who you agreed with this week regarding Crisis Point. And as I do every week, I can't thank my great co-hosts, Sarah, Casey, and Bill, for all they do. It's always great fun. And hey, I have a special announcement as we wrap things up this week. What? Yeah. What? You know, you know Bill and I, we love Casey and Sarah so much uh, that starting in two weeks, when we start discussion on season three of Discovery, Sarah and Casey are going to alternate weeks as co-hosts with Bill and I as we break down each episode of Discovery Season 3. We are? You are. Mm-hmm. Oh, you didn't get the memo? Well, that's what you guess. That's what, that's what you get from missing... Yeah, you go ahead and do it, that's Bill. That's what happens when you miss staff meetings, yeah. Doctor. Yeah, absolutely. So we can't wait for that. We, we've really enjoyed it's having awesome. you guys on, and we're going to keep it going. Can't wait. Uh, but we still have one more amazing episode of Lower Decks left, so we look forward to sitting down next week and talking about Episode 10, No Small Parts. So until next week... Never stop discovering. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek is a production of Coconut Media Works, executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.